Watch this. He recorded two Boise police officers in a downtown parking garage on his phone and wound up under arrest. His charges were later dropped. But a year later, Ty Warenka, who's known to Boise police for his activism and for his capturing of law enforcement on camera, is now suing those officers and the city of Boise in U.S. District Court. His lawsuit, filed Monday, claims the officers violated his civil rights. Here's investigative reporter Morgan Romero. Around 3 a.m. on June 11th, 2022, Boise police body camera video shows officers arresting Ty Waranka in a parking garage on Capitol in Maine. So what are, you, what are you arresting me for? They claimed he obstructed Corporal Denny Carter from doing his job. Waranka was charged with resisting and obstructing and booked into jail. What was I obstructing? My investigation. How is I obstructing your investigation? Can you try to block my view? Block your view from what? My Mr. face? Obama? I'm trying to have a conversation with you. Carter and another officer, Avery Westendorf, were there to respond to a car accident at the pay station. Waranka was leaving work and driving out of the garage at the time. A parking garage employee asked him to move along. So he left, walked back in, and got out his phone. That's something I do all the time. Anytime I see something strange with police, like I'll take, stop and take the time if I have it to just record it and just see what's happening, and if the people need the footage, I'll give it to them. The employee again told him to leave. It's private property. Here, you can see Waranka walking away. But as Officer Westendorf's body camera and Waranka's cell phone video show, the situation escalated. I'm not in I'm trying to leave. What do you think I'm doing? You just stop me. Let me make this clear. I want to make it super clear. So, so sure, tell me what, tell me what. No, just interfere anyway. Take that out of my oh. I'm not resisting. I'm not resisting. You're an I'm not resisting. When I reached down to grab it, he like shoved me in the neck and grabbed my arm and pushed me up against the wall and started putting cuffs on me and told me I was under arrest for obstruction. This is what led Waranka and his attorney Jonathan Baldoff to file a lawsuit in federal court against the city of Boise and the two officers, claiming they unlawfully arrested Waranka and violated his civil rights. This complaint says officers arrested and searched him without probable cause, used excessive and unreasonable force during the arrest, and caused him serious physical injuries. People a lot of times say, this, this isn't Boise, this doesn't happen here or whatever. It's like, well, I think this case is a prime example of one of many that this sort of stuff does happen here. His suit also claims BPD and the city attorney's office have a pattern of acting indifferently to the constitutional rights of Boiseans and people visiting. Why did you decide to file a federal lawsuit? Um, I'm really interested in seeing some actual accountability. It seems like that's something that's lacking within the Boise Police Department and like Boise generally with any of our public officials. And at any point in time, they could have stepped in and said, no, don't do that. But, you know, it had to take me hiring an attorney and going through all the steps in order to try to actually clear my name. Like I have nightmares about the situation and like about other police. And I think overall, like the city also suffered too and everybody else, because how are you, how is anybody supposed to have faith in police? when they see something like this. Like, it's kind of an abject failure, I think, of the system at hand. Ty, you have the right to remain silent. So I would crazy. request that you do so. One might say, in watching this story and reading it on social media, well, did he show up to the situation to agitate it? Did he get in the officer's face to then escalate the situation himself? What would you say to that? I think that's a great question. And then if you look at the footage, you'll see that that's not what happened at all. He actually approached me. Um, I wasn't saying anything to him at the time. I was just filming the situation as I was walking away. In this federal lawsuit, Warenka is asking for a million dollars and wants the case to go before a jury. While well, Renka's charges were dismissed in October, the city saying although there was probable cause to bring the case, there has been a, quote, change in the complexion of the state's case and it can no longer prove a matter beyond a reasonable doubt. Warenka well, was not only known to Boise police because of his social justice work with a group called Boise Mutual Aid prior to this, but Boise police also ticketed him at a protest and Idaho State Police arrested him during a protest at the Capitol. So, Brian, to show that there's accountability within the department, he mentioned accountability. So mm -hmm. in that vein,
He said at the very least what the city could do is hire a permanent director for its Office of Police Accountability, OPA. We know that office fields uh, citizen complaints. It looks into police conduct and it reviews police investigations. That position has sat vacant for six months now since Jesus Hara, the former director, was fired right. back in December after a whole, you know, saga of issues involving Chief Lee. But I also reached out to Boise Police for comment on this. They said, as always, with any pending litigation, they can't comment on lawsuits. They also noted that Corporal Carter, the one that is seen uh, pushing him, slapping the phone out of the hand, has retired. He retired earlier this year. Okay, so what is the latest with the OPA, the director? Again, empty for six months. Yeah, so ever since Jesus Hara was let go, they've been on the hunt. They have an interim director right now. But in April, the city said, we've got three finalists. We've got these three people that we're looking at. And we didn't hear much else after right. that. So the Idaho Press actually reached out, and a spokesperson for Boise Police told the Idaho Press that those folks weren't really the right fit for the okay. city. They interviewed with panels. They interviewed with uh, the council members that oversee OPA. They interviewed with the mayor. They said not a right fit for the office or for the community. So they're sort of back to the drawing board. And I did just get a recent statement about an hour ago from the city spokesperson who said they're currently working with their city recruiting team in HR to identify and then actively reach out to potential candidates. All right. We'll stay tuned for that. Thank you very much, Morgan. You bet. Okay, so so much rain and so little time over the last couple of days, especially on Tuesday. The Treasure Valley and more specifically the Boise area saw inches of rain in just a couple of hours that evening. An event we and our drainage systems aren't really used to seeing living in a high desert and all. And that caused issues like standing water across roads and intersections. And while that made for some cool social media posts, you know, like people making the most of the situation, paddling in the co-op parking lot and such, some also made things worse for those trying to help. Yesterday, the Ada County Highway District tweeted reminders about roadway etiquette, like not purposefully veering into flooded lanes to splash water onto our workers as they cleared water from the roadways. Or not only is it rude and disrespectful, but it's dangerous for several reasons. Crews are often working in the roads, and the force of a car throwing water could knock crews over. That water is being splashed up. It's also dirty. It's been on the ground, it's carrying anything from oil, gasoline, chemicals, lawn treatment, that kind of stuff, and debris. Who knows what else? They also want to remind you that the crews who are out there working, they're part of this community. They're working to keep the raid roads safe, not just for them, but for you. And with more rain on the way, they're asking you to please be respectful. Slow down, follow their directions. They added these reminders are intended for the few who thought they were just having some fun out there. But those in the minority are kind of ruining it for the majority. ACHD explained why this is their safety concern, not only for their roadside crews, but for drivers too. In the trenches during the spring, we get these events occasionally, and it requires kind of an all-hands-on-deck to, to handle the situation in the roadway. A couple times, yes. Heavy rains. Now, everything that we saw from two, two nights ago was um, really atypical. They weren't areas that typically get flooding. Uh, we had just finished a 10-hour shift, and that weather came in very unexpectedly. We called people back in. Sometimes after hours work is, is necessary. And they, they understand that comes with the job. Our drainage trucks are out doing emergency response. So uh, handling everything that we could to remove the water as quickly as possible from the roadway. Very dangerous situation as it is with the high water and the, the lightning that we were working around. And there was just a few disrespectful motorists. Fast moving vehicles running through the water and sending a lot of water at our emergency crews while they're trying to work. In some cases, they, our crews actually saw them move from an outside lane to an inside lane. But when a motorist splashes that much water on, they're spending the rest of the shift completely drenched. And it just makes for um, a very difficult time. A lot of them were frustrated. Whether it was intentional or, or accidental, the end result was the same. It doesn't take much for your, for your car to float. So it's just not a good idea. Um, and if they're driving too fast and it's a small amount of water, they could easily hydroplane. We're trying to make the, the roadways as safe as possible, and every motorist and every commuter can assist with that. ACHD adds this isn't just a problem for the crews that were clearing flood water. They say regular roadside crews fixing and maintaining the roads, they also deal with issues similar to this year-round, and it's becoming more frequent. How often? Well, did you notice this in the video there that we just showed? The first road construction site we went to today featured a worker with a camera on the top of his helmet. There he is there. When we tried to ask him why, his supervisor at Sunrock Construction, well, she shut us down. But they have a policy against talking to media, I guess. He did tell us off camera, though. He put his camera on his head to get video of drivers who got out of the way or go out of their way to be disrespectful. But ever since he clipped that camera on his helmet, 
He said it hasn't really been much of a problem. Drivers started treating him with more respect. So this next story was by far the one we got the most comments on this week. We'll explain why in just a minute, but a little background. Earlier this year, Interface Sanctuary started a homeless art collective, an idea spawned by one of their guests. Well, thanks to donations of materials and studio space, artists experiencing homelessness would be able to express themselves in a creative way and then also have a chance to make some money. They could create art, a painting, a drawing, crochet, something, whatever, and then sell it through the St. Vincent de Paul thrift store. Well, a few weeks ago, the shelter got a donation of denim, and that gave them another idea, creating a special collection where artists can still art, but the money made goes to a cause much bigger than themselves. We got a donation of 501 jeans. I think there was like 40 to 50. Yeah. So we were like, we got to do something with these jeans, and we came up with the idea that each artist would take a couple pairs of jeans and paint on them and do whatever they want to do with them. These are uh, some graffiti that I did, and um, it just says Boise and some random stuff right here on the side. And then hopefully we can auction them off and raise money for the shelter. You know, when someone donates a bunch of 501s to a nonprofit, oh, really? <laughs> the project kind of yeah. names itself. It's the 501c3 project, and you know, it gives everybody an opportunity to do something. Do something. It's cool, dude. For the place doing something for them. Exactly. Give back. And that's really important to all of them here. So, giving back to the people that help them. And um, so, this was easy. It's important to people like Jose. Yeah, I'm a resident. I stay on the programming side. But maybe not so easy. And I'll eventually paint over it. This is just kind of like a rough draft. Jose is a member of the Homeless Art Collective. This is going to be roses and then the sky, maybe some birds up here, and then it's called my last name. And then this is just like a logo on here. Maybe this is going to turn into peacock feathers down here. Who's never drawn on jeans. This is like a trial or error kind of a thing. It's the first time for me, so... I'm learning. You got to start somewhere, you know? I started out drawing, and I still went back to do more definition because the brush I have is not that great. You know, like with these guys. Here's some flowers. Got a little Rubik's Cube, checker, action, 80s, 90s, back to the future ish. Pretty cool. Shorts, cut off shorts. Some random love designs. I believe we call those jarts. I didn't, I'm not an artist. I just kind of watch, but. To me, just, I didn't understand what art did for people. Oh, like the cat. Chris Alvarez does. That's cool. A former guest of Interfaith Sanctuary, he's now a full-time tattoo artist. Yeah. And the director of the Art Collective. It sounds kind of kind of corny when I say it, but art as like a vehicle for change. Right on, little heart. Hello, sunshine. This one even has um, stuff sewn in it, like that. Flares. Yep, flares on the side. Got a little bit of design, got a UFO. Coming in and being a part of the Art Collective 
I realized how important art and creativity is to people's well-being. <laughs> it gives them a sense of purpose, hope, meaning, connection. Like we all sit around, hang out, we do art. Okay, some more graffiti stuff, just random writing. This one says peace. Cool, more graffiti. It's got mandalas on it, which is really cool. You know, it's about connecting to everybody else. Like it's like, you know, it's a greater community. It's, it's, it's forming um, something great. It's just more awareness of, uh, of positivity. And I think it makes waves. Chris was also a guest there at one point. In case you're wondering how you can get your hands on a pair of these fly button fly jeans, Interface Sanctuary has not yet decided on a date for that auction or how if they're going to go about selling them by auction or just putting them up at St. Vincent de Paul. But when they let us know, we will let you know. And remember, they need some money right now. They need to come up with millions to cover the cost of renovating their new home on West State Street. There's going to be a big pile of these jeans that are going to be for sale, but a couple of them kind of got some attention. Well, a certain pair anyway. This week, Chris made this fine pair for us here on the 208. That's, as I said, Tuesday, it's a little bit embarrassing, but it's also kind of cool. And so, as I mentioned then, if you've ever wanted to get into my pants, we're going to let the bidding begin. We got a couple of bids. They're size 40, by the way. Waist, size 40, 32 inseam. Wash at your own risk because, again, they're Sharpie or permanent marker made to, make, to uh, use them. But, or that's what was used to make them. We ran this story on Tuesday. We got some bids, like 50 bucks here from Danny. Where do the proceeds go? And as I mentioned, they go to the Interfaith Sanctuary because they need a lot of money to pay for those renovations on State Street. Brianna and Melba said 100 bucks. And I showed this one already. She wants to get into my pants, but she can't tell my husband. I'm not going to say a thing. But as I said on Tuesday as well, he probably will see you wearing them around the house, right? Charlie and Pam. This one is interesting. I've never been interested in your pants, Brian. However, if we bid $208, if it goes to the Interface Sanctuary and you get to keep the pants, that is a great idea. So how about this? We kind of run a not so silent auction here on the 208 and for now and forever, I guess, or at least until we sell them. But text your bid, 208-321-5614. We're going to put all the proceeds to the Interface Sanctuary and the highest bid right now, $208, which again, sounds like a perfect bid for the 208, but we'll take anything above that and anything above that will get you into my pants and will get Interface Sanctuary closer to getting into their new building.
Well, I hope you've been enjoying the afternoon and the evening. And of course, this is what's taking place right now as we're doing that in Boise, the west end of the valley, uh, the lower uh, right here, the lower Treasure Valley. Uh, you can see out here toward Ontario as well as sections of Malheur County. All this green area is a flood watch that's in effect that comes all the way out here, as you see, to Canyon County. And the line is the Canyon Ada County line right along through here. So uh, you can see that Boise at this particular point is not within that. But if you take a look at their la latest radar, you'll see over here in eastern Oregon, the yellows and the green greens. This is uh, some pretty heavy rain taking place in some of those spots there to the west. We've had reports about a quarter of an inch to a half an inch of rain out through this area of eastern or eastern Oregon. Some of it has moved in, as you see, toward the Boise area. Not very close, but there's been some light showers along through there. And the temperatures today have been on the cool side. They've only been the upper 60s, around 70 degrees. So we really have not produced any kind of thunderstorms around the area. But that's not true for Sun Valley, where you see all the lightning strikes. So they did it again. There's another evening with storms that are moving through the area. Same thing for Twin Falls. So that's just to the east of us. So the likelihood is an isolated thunderstorm for tonight, but more in the way of rain showers and especially to the west end of the valley. Now, as you look at the next uh, seven days, you'll see it continues through the weekend. Not as heavy, but it gets heavier into Monday and Tuesday. Look for more thunderstorms there. And then it finally dries up sunshine. Temperature still pretty nice in the 70s. OK, so that storm Tuesday night, the one that dumped nearly two inches of rain in some parts of Ada County, caused some serious flash flooding, power outages, road closures, stalled cars for those who try to drive through the flooded areas, wind, rain, hail, and a lot of lightning. Like a lot. According to the National Weather Service in Boise, Ada County saw the most lightning strikes in one day in 23 years. 1,449 in 24 hours. Of course, most of those strikes struck during the two plus hours when those storms were just building on themselves and parked over the upper Treasure Valley. But it wasn't just the lightning that was a lot all at once. We mentioned the flooding, the nearly two inches of rain in those two hours of rolling storms, an inch and three quarters measured at Albertson Stadium on the campus of Boise State. Well, all that water had to go somewhere. I mean, that is after it slowly seeped into the storm drains. We got a text from an observant viewer Wednesday, the next morning, Rick writing in to say the Boise River definitely swelled from all that rain, an increase of 800 cubic feet per second in one hour, Rick said, which took 12 hours to recede. And he's right, sort of. Taking a look at the gauge at Glenwood Bridge, the stream flow was steady at just below 4,000 CFS, which is where it's been since last Saturday. See that spike right there? Right around 7 p.m., it was clocked at 3,930 CFS, about 30 to 45 minutes after the rains began. Then it starts to rise, so that by 8.45, an hour and 45 minutes later, that flow was 640 cubic feet per second higher at 4,570. And it wasn't until 8.15 the next morning that the water dropped back to around 4,000 CFS. So we asked the Army Corps of Engineers if this was unusual, if the Boise River is that sensitive to rainfall. Short answer, yes, it is. They told us there are 93 square miles of river that can be impacted by local rain events. And typically, you can see a change in the river flow anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours after the rain starts to fall. But usually, we don't see that much rain. So it's usually like a rise anywhere from 100 to 200 CFS, not the 640 in an hour 45. The Army Corps of Engineers also told us the flows on the Boise River are going to remain around 4,000 CFS through at least next week, give or take a few hundred if we get rain. The reason is the snow in the mountains is melting at a pretty quick pace. They tell us there's about 10% of our snowpack left. Snow line is about 8,000 feet right now, and water is flowing into the Boise River system reservoirs at about 9,000 cubic feet per second. And those reservoirs are 95% full. Lucky Peak, about two feet from completely full.
Got several comments today about Ty Warenka's million dollar lawsuit against the city of Boise. A lot of them similar to this one here from Larry. Ty was, has, was, and is just looking for a payday. He was asked to leave the garage, didn't. So at least he was trespassing and could have been arrested for that. So now we'll have to see if it goes to a jury trial, what they will decide. Same mindset that deliberately, spla deliberately splashes water on workers and pedestrians and is the mindset that blows black diesel smoke on bikers and pedestrians. Rude and should be illegal, says Doug in McCall. I believe that's called coal rolling. Is that what that's called? Yeah, it's gross and unnecessary and rude. You are correct. Is it just me or is the general public becoming just more disrespectful people that are trying more disrespectful to people that are trying to help them? People should be more respectful and try to help those that are trying to help them rather than disturb them during their work. Have a good day. Thank you for sending that in. It does seem to be that way. So people see a chance to kind of splash some water, maybe catch video of that, post it on social media. They'll take that chance, I'm sure. Sold for $209 these pants. Lee Ann in Emmett. We can go higher than that. Again, we're trying to raise money for Interface Sanctuary as well. These pants are incredibly awesome. Size 40, that's okay. But I'm telling you, give us the money. We'll give you the pants. That money goes to Interface Sanctuary. We'll see you back here next week. Have a great weekend.